I'm Pico Aya, and I am hitting the ball really fast over the ping pong, pong net at Fukuoka-san, and the ball is coming back even faster, glancing the corner, impossible to return. Fukuoka-san is dressed in a young woman's slim black slacks and pink shirt, but she is playing like Novak Djokovic on steroids. And this is a bit surprising because Fukuoka-san can barely see over the top of the table. It's also a little humiliating because she's 81 years old. <laughs> Aren't you tired? I gasp as we finish 30 minutes of fierce practice and sweat is falling off me and I'm out of breath. No, she says with absolute serenity. I'm never tired because I never move. When I moved from New York City to the ancient Japanese capital of Kyoto 28 years ago, I was traveling in order to learn about unmovedness and focus and the beauty of being knit into community. So I checked into a Zen monastery for a year. And of course, my high-minded year lasted exactly a week, which was long enough to find out that a Zen monastery in practice is nothing like the one you imagine when you're sitting in midtown Manhattan. Uh, it's not just about watching the full moon and composing deathless haiku. It's mostly about scrubbing floors and washing dishes. So I moved into a single room on the back streets of Kyoto. And my second week there, I met the glamorous woman who had become my wife. Our courtship uh, was not an easy one. Uh, I had to watch the movie Goonies again and again. I had to pretend to love Sting as much as Sting seems to love Sting, which is no easy thing. <laughs> and most of all, I had to tolerate Hiroko's love of exercise. Every time she had a day off, she would go across the street to the gym and devote herself to literally seven or eight hours of high-intensity aerobics, kickboxing, weight training, and yoga. Uh, as you can tell, my idea of exercise is watching her head out of the door and then collapsing into an exhausted heap. But the Japanese, as many of you know, are nothing if not patient. So 17 years after we first met, she came back one evening and said, didn't you used to play ping pong? Yeah, you know, 30 years ago when I was trying to get out of homework at school. Maybe you'd like to try again, she said. It didn't sound promising, but I followed her across the street the next day, and we found ourselves in a spotless blonde wood studio within the gym where two tables had been set up, and eight elderly Japanese were playing in a fierce, concentrated silence. And space was so cramped that on each of the tables, two different pairs were practicing, some hitting forehands across the diagonal, some hitting backhands. Occasionally, the balls would collide in midair, and everybody would say, wow. Would, uh, would you like to join us, said a man in his 70s in rather elegant English. So I joined in, and I quickly found that men mostly played with men, women played with women. When the games began, they were always of doubles, and somebody would announce the score in a kind of English, all seven or deuce one, but nobody would really listen to the score except that between practice points or even between games, the pairs would change at the speed of light to ensure that nobody would keep losing. And so I started going uh, across the street every night and I learned how to choose my partner by playing rock, paper, scissors. Uh, I saw that the men were officially in charge but the women were calling all the shots. Uh, <laughs> One of the women was a grandmother with a gray buzz cut, and she would literally windmill her arm around before serving. And then when she and I would occasionally win a point, she would dance around like an excited bear and high-five me. Uh, one of the men, who always looked really forbidding and stern at the local bus stop, only had to see one of his slams go on, and he would pump his fist and say, Yosh! And one night I went back to my apartment, and I opened the book that I'd been reading, and I found the perfect quote from Herodotus, of all people. Man is most himself when he achieves the concentrated seriousness of a child at play. Now, the studio where we practiced uh, had floor-to-ceiling mirrors on two sides, and on the third, it had a window looking out on our central neighborhood park. And so in November, I could see the blaze of the maple leaves. And in April, I could see the cherry blossoms frothing. 
And sometimes one member in our group of 30 or so would suddenly disappear, and I'd ask what happened, and I would just get back the single Japanese word, gan, cancer. Uh, sometimes a small, very sweet, clumsy-looking guy clutching a man purse would arrive, and all my pals would ask me to play with him, and in, turn, in time I realized it was because he was a professional gangster, and none of them wanted to get close to him. Uh, in time, I also realized that nearly all my new friends had been children during the war. So they had endured years of bombing and then years of starvation at the end of the war, and they were the ones who had made the Japanese miracle. In fact, one man told me that he had been posted by his company in the British Midlands in 1963 with not a word of English and not a single other Asian face to be seen. And one day his daughter visited, and I met this very sleek senior purser for Cathay Pacific Airways, and I really felt as if I was seeing the history of modern Japan. But I also felt I was seeing the predicament of modern Japan, because some of my new companions would use the handshake grip, which is a traditional Western way of clutching the paddle as if you were extending your hand. Quite a few others use the traditional Eastern system known as the penholder grip, where you clutch the paddle as if you were wielding a calligraphy brush. And that really seemed to be the state of modern Japan, halfway between China and North America, not really sure how much to follow Marshall McLuhan, how much to follow Confucius. And one of the very first things you learn when you get to Japan is how hard it is to eat noodles with a knife and fork. The second thing you learn is how very difficult it is to eat a piece of steak with chopsticks. So the seasons passed, 44 of them and counting, and one day I suddenly heard one of my partners shout in English, oh no, and I realized I was leaving my mark on them as much as the other way around. Then I heard somebody shout, dame des, and I realized it was me. And one night, finally, one of my slams hit the table. And one of the grandmothers turned to me and she said, it's a goi pico-chan, which is the affectionate suffix generally reserved for very close friends, children, and pets. And <laughs> I went across the room and I went across the road and I reported this to Hiroko. And she said, you have become an idol. Here you are, 53 years old, five foot seven and a half, nobody's idea of a heartthrob, and yet, you are the youngest by 20 years, you're one of the tallest, and you're known by your first name, like Beyonce. <laughs> and I looked around the two-room apartment we have shared for more than 20 years, no car, no bicycle, no TV I can understand, no media whatsoever. I thought of the ping pong club, and I remembered why I had come to Japan in the first place, to learn about stillness, attention, and the grace of being knit into a community. I had found my monastery at last. <laughs>